Let's sing this together. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Compass Fellowship. You online, welcome to Compass Fellowship. We're glad you're here today. And uh, we're, going to be, we're back in James, and we're going to have a great time worshiping the Lord today. So let's just have a, have a word of prayer as we start. And uh, uh, our, youth ret- uh, our youth are on a retreat this week, and so we'll make that as an announcement. We'll pray for them, but uh, I'm going to include them this morning so that uh, we can uh, just ask God's blessing over them as well as us here. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the way in which you take care of us every day. We thank you for this whole week um, that's taking place. And and for the week that will come this week, we thank you for the blessings you have in our lives. We thank you for the young people, um, seven students and three leaders who are up there at, um, at Pinebrook this weekend. We pray that even this morning as they may be having uh, different um, sessions that you might uh, work in the kids' hearts. Oftentimes these youth events are things that impact uh, young people for life. And we ask that you might do that for at least one, if not all, of these uh, seven students who are up there this weekend. We ask to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing this morning.
Set to rule and reign on hearts and hearts again. Increase and as we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come and made us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Build your kingdom, build your kingdom. 
build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Kingdom's power, reaching to near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with your strength and love of Christ. We are your church, we are the hope. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. All righty. Yeah, you may be seated. We have some announcements. Okay, you may be seated now, and uh, we're going through some announcements here. If you go, uh, take a look, and uh, we're going to do the next slide. We have, um, first of all, the uh, service project was, uh, if you remember, they were going to do service projects. Dave, you can go ahead and sit down here, okay? Um, they were going to do ser service projects. Go ahead and sit, okay? Um, we're doing the service projects, and um, they, they were painting murals throughout the town, and so this is some of the pictures of the murals, as you can see up there. Uh, they did the outlines. Had to get borough permission and everything else, and so they'll be doing that again. And the idea is to put murals around town in order to be able to uh, dress up Marsville and make it more attractive to folks. So um, we have a, uh, our young people are doing that uh, in town, and that's being, of course, led by those from the Solid Rock Youth Center. So we're glad for that. Uh, next, uh, the snow glow. This is the this is the young people that we preached for earlier. There's seven who are at the snow glow retreat, <coughs> as well as three leaders. So you might pray that uh, they. Um, uh, I'm mostly concerned with their spiritual well-being, you know. Uh, we want them to have fun. We want them to talk about all kinds of things that went on neat there um, and um, have a safe trip up and back, but mostly we want the Lord to work on their hearts. So if you kind of remember them, uh, they'll be leaving there around 1230 today, supposedly. So um, anyway, any rate, keep them in prayer until then that the Lord will work on their lives. Uh, next. Um, Lily Herbster used to come here a number of years ago. I don't know if you remember, there were about four older ladies that sat over here. Pat Meter used to drive them here, and uh, Zelma passed away a while back, and then after she passed away, they started going to a church closer to them um, over there. But at any rate, she passed away, Lily did, so I just want to let you know, uh, we're going to be out of town um, this, this weekend, but um, it's on Friday the 27th, if anyone would like to go, anyone would like to go on a Friday. From 12.15 to 1.15 will be the viewing, and then the service starts at 1.15. Uh, so uh, just to let you know about that. Next slide. Oh, we, they took out the slides for the updates coming up. Uh, we need to get those back in. Uh, if you remember, uh, we gave some dates. The 24th, uh, the 12th of February is a team meeting, okay? The 24th um, is, the, is the 27th, whatever that Friday night is, is our congregational meeting. So please put that on your calendar, that congregational meeting. We want you all to come. The potluck starts around 6.15, and then at um, uh, around uh, 7 o'clock, we'll have the service. Uh, we'll have the, not service, but the, uh, the business meeting. And a lot of people think business meetings are just, you know, I mean, you're doing a lot of business. But, I mean, we try to make it like a, a celebration service. And so we'll sing a few songs, and we'll uh, have some reports. And uh, it's, it's really a neat time, and it's one of the more unique times of our um, uh, of our uh, sessions through the uh, through the year, so um, good time to have, bring a potluck and just have some fun. Um, I don't know, George, are you going to come this year? 
he, he, he always, brought, for years, he always brought these barbecued ribs, and I thought, man, they're so good. Finally, after about the third year, I said, well, do, well, do you make these or what? You know, he says, no, I get them. He told me where he got them. So for the last year or two, I've been buying them at the same place, you know. <laughs> uh, they're really good. So if you show up, I'm going to look for the barbecue ribs. But at any rate, so uh, we put those, uh, put those dates on your calendars, if you will, uh, to make sure. Team members, um, and there's a couple other slides they missed, too, here this week. Well, I tell you, the youth people, you people go away, and, you know, you miss a bunch of stuff. Um, the, um, the uh, what was they saying? Team meeting. team meeting. If you're on the team, we need you to be working on your budgets. In your boxes in there are the last three years of expenses, so you can take a look at what you spent over the last three years and make a recommendation of what you think you might spend this year based on last year and based on where we're at. Uh, remembering that the last three years, we had some COVID years in there, so might be some changes there. So be sure you get those. Also, all team members are supposed to be turning in reports for the last year so we can do our annual report. Don't wait till the last minute. That way we're rushing and we're trying to get stuff in the annual report, print it out and get it all right, and it just becomes a mess. So if you're a team member and you have a report on your particular subject, get it in, send it to the secretary uh, at, uh, at cfpc.me or send it to me. And, uh, or both of us, prefer preferably, and we'll get those done. Uh, Ron, you out there? Bring, would you bring one of those uh, lists, please, in? The, the list there, the directory lists, okay? So we've got a directory list here. We've got three of them out there. So you don't have to do each one, but we have this directory list out here, and we're going to, people said, oh, we need a new directory. And yes, we do. People's day, uh, I've changed. We have some new people in and so forth. So the directory list here, there's plenty of room. We've checked off those of you who've been good and already done it last week, okay? You want a check mark next to your name. So well, we want you to go through this. Even if your information has not changed, please come and initial one of the three sheets. There's two sheets here and there's one in the back. It doesn't matter which sheet. We'll take them all and use, and use them all. So just one sheet, find one sheet, make sure everything, it could be a misspelling. We found someone whose name we misspelled and uh, you know, they were in the last directory that way and never, never knew it. So check this off. If everything's correct, just initial it. If anything's not correct, please change it on here so we can get the directory right, uh, at least as best as we can. Thank you very much, Ron. So there's, there's two here and one there. We made, we made so many, so you don't have to stand in line while someone else is doing the only one we have. There's plenty. Uh, find one and do it, okay? Um, Lillian is still in the hospital, Lillian Piscopo. She's down in uh, Jefferson. They did the operation. It was a success. So they're trying to get her off of stuff, so please remember her. Um, and I'm forgetting someone else. Dee uh, continues to have uh, problems with her. Um, you know, um, dry heaves and other stuff relating to her liver. Uh, there was somebody else. Oh. Uh, yeah, send Zach a, um, a, a note to make sure he gets that on the next week's list. While you're doing that, make, put the other two things on there we missed this week, too, so they get them back on there, okay? Um, I, will, I will not be here the next two weeks, okay? Uh, our... our uh, all of our kids decided they wanted to go down to Florida for Disney World, so we're going to go with them. So we won't be gone for the whole two weeks. We're going to visit Lynn and uh, De uh, Leah and, and um, Steve Atkinson, you know, while we're on our way down. So we're going to spend a couple days with them. So it's kind of neat to see somebody that's been here for a while. Uh, so then we'll be down there. We'll be driving back next uh, the following Sunday, so, uh, February 5th. So please keep our prayers through our, through our trips, but uh, you'll have somebody else taking care of things. And uh, because they're gone, I, I guess. I'm doing everything today. So I'm doing the announcements, the opening, the music, and preaching. So um, if I survive today, I mean, that's what I used to do when I first came here, right? This is, this is the only one. So anyway, praise God. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, did I forget someone else? There's someone else I seem like I wanted to pray for. Hey, Theo Davis? Okay, with cancer. Oh, yeah, okay, right, yeah, yeah, Victoria, Victoria, right. Yeah, uh, has pancreatic cancer. Excuse me? That's the other one. So uh, Theo is, um, uh, Theo and Victoria, uh, Victoria was here last week. <coughs> Theo has uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, prognosis is not really great, so pray for them. They're good friends of George, and they're actually, they actually take care of George's mom. Uh, and then the other one I visited, visited was Floria. I know I visited somebody else. Floria is in a hospital. Visitor, she has cancer also, but they did an operation. They think they got it all. And so um, she's, she was in good spirits when I walked in. At least after I walked in, she was there. She was, uh, she, just so you know, she called me her angel. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> I also got to see Lillian down there, and they were both surprised to see us, but uh, that's good. So, dear Lord, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you for taking care of people. We pray for Theo with his pancreatic cancer, such a difficult one. And uh, we pray for Victoria, who was here last week. We thank you for her being here. And for them, we ask for Lillian that you might help her to continue to be able to breathe, get her pulse ox up and her, her breathing up so they can send her home. And also for Floria, we thank you for the good operation that, uh, that took place in her life. We ask that you might just continue to improve her so that she's uh, able to um, get out of the hospital soon and, and come home and rejoin us here. Um, we also ask for Dee, especially as she continues to have uh, struggles with this uh, uh, kidney um, problem and, and disease, and we ask that you might help her to be, the, the, and Pastor Ken both, they're, they're, uh, Pastor Ken's probably as upset as she is about the whole thing. Help them to be able to have the wisdom when they talk to the doctors to know exactly what to do. Now we bring all these requests and some of the unknown requests that some of us have in our own lives today to you. Um, they don't need to be spoken out loud, but you know our hearts, and we pray for that you might uh, just answer those requests in the way you want them answered, not necessarily the way we want them answered. That uh, you might help us to accept your answers and that you, we know that you hear us and you're involved in each one of these situations, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I just got her. Uh, uh, yeah, but later. That's probably why your wife was texting you and telling you I forgot Floria. Yeah, she, she's, she's probably watching online saying, Pas that's the, what his pastor's trying to remember. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, uh, that's so, so that means we've got people online. That's always neat to have people online. Lillian always watches. Oh, I've I got to tell you this one thing, okay? Lillian told me when I was there, her hand on the left was all black and blue from all the stuff. And I said, well, I said, uh, I said I'm going to tell the people when they get to church that, that you hit the doctors with it, and that's why it's black and blue. She said, you wouldn't dare. I said, well, you better not dare me because you know that that's something you shouldn't do. So if you're listening, Lillian, or if you listen to this, I'm, I bet you're dare, okay? But uh, uh, she, I, her arm's all black and blue. She had so many things. Even while I was standing there, they were pulling it off. So I was trying to keep on talking to distract her from all the pain from them. You know how it goes when they put those uh, things and then they start ripping them off your arm. So uh, at any rate, so let's all stand and sing once more before we have our message of the morning. Revelation song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. This is what John's vision when he when he saw his vision. This if you read the beginning of Revelation, this is the angels uh, or the creatures um, singing this out. This is what he heard. Uh, parts of it. So join with us. Revelation song. Oh 
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath in living water, such a marvelous mystery. God will make a way here below. Say God will, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my God. New day, he will make a way. He will make a way. In his time, in his time, he makes all things new. guys are going to want me to call your attention to that joke up there. <laughs> they, they do do a great job, and uh, we, we throw a lot of curves at them, and we just uh, we thank the tech guys who do their job, but uh, sometimes they get that. Oh, that's the other thing we got to talk about. Yeah, the Eagles won. I'll tell you, I was a little nervous last night. You know, before the game started, I thought, boy, playing the Giants of all teams, if we lose to the Giants after beating them twice this year, and I mean... What's going to happen in the church service? I don't know. Uh, you guys are going to be so discouraged, and I don't know. Condolences, Jody. Ravens missed it last year. They, they missed it by, t by, by one foot twice. 
you know. The, the, if the guy had been on the, over the goal line six more inches, they would have got a touchdown instead of, a, they would have got a touchdown instead of the other team. And then the end, the guy dove for the ball, had it on his fingertips, and just it, it dropped, you know, after a bomb into the end zone. So sorry about that. Um, we're looking for somebody to donate now that the Ravens are out of it. Donate a Eagle shirt to Jody so she can uh, display the proper uniform for the, for the next week at least, and let's hope it goes beyond that. <laughs> Actually, uh, we gave, we, my wife bought two gifts. This is how things go out. She bought two gifts, the same identical, and she gave one to Uncle Tony, to Tony Martin. Um, what was a large, and it's kind of like, uh, he's a little bit more hefty, so it's like he's squeezing into this thing. He says, well, this is an impetus to try to lose weight, I guess. Well, three weeks later, she found the one she was supposed to really give him in a closet, which was his size, <laughs> you know? And she, so she said, I don't know what the, I think the extra one was for you. Uh, and I said, well, I said, we should have got it, oh, maybe we should get it back from him and give it to Jody so she can, uh, she can enjoy them. At any rate, we're in the book of James today, right? And we're going to be finishing up the chapter four, and then for the next couple of weeks, we'll be in chapter five, and then we're through with James. When we finish James, we're going to go into some sort of a Lenten series. Uh, that'll be 40 days. Uh, well, we're going to have a, a Vision Sunday first, and then we'll be uh, uh, going in the end of uh, February. We'll be coming to the time of uh, 40 days before uh, Easter, and we'll, we'll have a new series to go through that. So we're in chapter four this, um, this week, of, uh, and the last uh, five verses, basically, and, uh, but today's also, beside the Eagle Celebration and beside some of the other things we talked about, it's also a Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And so I, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, this last year, the, um, the Roe v. Wade was overturned. And uh, some things we need to realize is everybody got all upset about that, but that really didn't, that really didn't protect life at all, that, that particular thing. All that did was take the, take the rule away that said that it was supposed to be a constitutional right. It didn't, it didn't actually uh, inhibit or limit uh, abortions in any way, shape, or form. Um, all it did was say the states will decide. So now we have the states deciding. And uh, so um, if you can't get abortion in your state, you can go to another state or whatever. Um, I, just, I just have a couple of statistics I want to throw out to you here. Um, uh, it's still, uh, abortion is still legal in 21 states and D.C. Um, seven states have uh, abortion uh, available up to the day before birth. Um, the um, um, two of those, including uh, including New Jersey and Delaware, 14 other states have laws limiting abortion, um, um, but um, it's still it's still legal. And um, it's interesting because abortions are declining. They're now le actually less than they were in 1973. But when they look at the statistics, it's not necessarily because of some of the things that have been done to try to limit them, but uh, births in the United States are down. And so since births are down, then also uh, those that are uh, trying to have abortions are going to have abortions, thank you, Josh, are also down. Um, I, I'm not going to read this because I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but there's, if you want to look at, um, uh, uh, on the internet, you can find all kinds of stats on it. But um, um, in 2017, there were 862,000 abortions in the United States. So that's where we are at this point, 862,000. Um, 13... Over 13 abortions per 1,000 women, aged 15 to 44. Um, one statistic I looked at said that in New York City, uh, I think this, let's see, is that this, let's see, 58% uh, of, um, let's see, does it go this one or not? Sixty percent of, of abortions were born outside the, uh, of patients who obtained abortions were born outside the United States. Um, it just, white patients account for 39% of abortions, black patients for 28%, and Hispanics for 25%, and 13% and, um, are Protestant, 24% um, Catholic, 38% no religious affiliation. Uh, in New York City, there were more, um, there were, um, and they have a high rate, um, there were more African-American ch children killed by abortion than were actually had live births. So, um, and if you know Planned Parenthood, their original, they were pretty racist in the beginning and their, op their, their goal was to reduce the black population and so they located their abortion clinics in black areas, unfortunately. And uh, today that still, that statistic still holds in many families. And so we need to pray for this in our, our nation. A lot of times it's, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, having uh, two families, you know, two, two uh, parents and a family can make a difference. 
and a lot of our families are splitting up and it's especially a problem in the African American community and so we need to continue to uh, pray for this and uh, encourage people to seek life. I think one of the other things that's helped lower it is uh, those states which require um, an ultrasound prior to an abortion and a lot of times when women see the ultrasound and see how formed their child is and how far along they are, it makes a difference for them. Um, I won't describe it, but I will tell you that if I describe to you, and I, I told you there's at least seven states that allow abortion up to the day before birth, if I describe to you how that abortion took place, you would, uh, I would probably get run of the church and people, I'd be getting uh, all kinds of posts on Facebook and everything about how gory I was and everything else. But uh, uh, my thought is if it's, if it's so gory and so brutal that you can't describe it in church, you can't describe it in public, how much brutal is it to actually do it? to be the victim of that. And so we really need to, we really need to keep this on the forefront and, and recognize that as believers, it's not about as much about stopping abortions as it is about getting those families and trying to encourage those women to change their mind and then supporting them afterwards. Choice one is where we give some of our money on our Easter offering we have in the past, and they provide, try to provide services for people, for ladies who are in trouble and have had, uh, had, had, had their children, have elected to have their children, but still have difficulties, so they try to encourage their hearts. Um, something else I found interesting was there used to be a Planned Parenthood Center right across from the um, Catholic pro-life center down on, uh, room four on Route 413. Planned Parenthood charged for all their services. I mean, their, their, their object is to make money in essence. And so they would send women over to the pro-life Catholic clinic to get the services such as an ultrasound or whatever other service or pregnancy test. They send them over there to get the services free and then encourage them to come back there to abort the child if they were actually pregnant, you know, some of them. So providing free services as pro-lifers uh, so that the women can have these services is, um, is, is, is very helpful to them. So um, at any rate, uh, Science of Human Life Sunday, we just got to need to remember that life is important. Amen? Okay. And we need to keep that at the forefront because there's many people who don't think that it's very important. Uh, and we, we need to encourage that. We are in the book of James. And if you go to the next slide, I'm going to give a quick review of um, where we were for the last little bit. I preached two weeks ago, and I talked about in the verses 1 through 6 how there were four problems that they, that they had in those verses. One was wrong associations, second was wrong attitudes, third was wrong accusations, and four was wrong aspirations. And if you look through those, or if you pick up my notes from those weeks, uh, or go online and, and listen to that sermon, you'll find those four. And wrong associations brought conflict. Wrong attitudes was because of pleasure. Wrong accusations was because of worldliness that crept in. And wrong aspirations were due to pride in people in believers' lives. Now, in verses 7 to 17, which Zach did last week and this week, and he did a good job as far as listing a lot of the things that were listed in those verses, uh, they're actually how to prevent some of those things on the left, like the wrong associations. And so to, to stop, to prevent wrong associations, resist the level and draw near to God. To prevent wrong attitudes, mourn over sin and humble yourselves. That will change our attitude if we, if we really look at sin the way it is and we humble ourselves before God. Wrong accusations, if we, uh, we, can, um, we can prevent those by not slandering our brothers, that brings up all kinds of problems in the, in the body, and then realizing that God is the righteous judge, but it's not our job to judge others, although uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't judge sin because the, the scriptures tell us as Christians and as, especially as, uh, as uh, a church to judge sin in our midst, so we need to do that, but when we have to realize God is the righteous judge, and then wrong aspirations, we're going to hit the day because it goes through verses 13 to 17, and in verse 13, it says, don't plan, um, or in verses 13 to 17, the first part says, don't plan without God, and then in the second way to prevent wrong aspirations is make sure you plan according to God's will. So basically, I've told you what the sermon's about this morning in those bottom two quadrants if you, as you look at it, and we're just going to go to a, in a little bit more detail, bring in some other verses. So if you'll go to the next slide, let's all stand and read the scriptures for this morning um, together. It's all on one slide. It's not a real long one. And I'd ask that we all read it together and uh, read so loud that the person next to you can hear. And it just, uh, that's just the way it works out. So let's all start on the first word. Uh, come, ready? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while 
and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Okay. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. And I've got three, um, three ways in which I could break it down. And, um, the first one is don't plan without God in verses 13 and 14. Don't plan without God. And there's two points to this. Um, actually, um, the first one is, well, actually, I think there's three points. One, what we think we know is in verse 13. Verse 13 says this. I'll get over one more page here. Verse 13 says this. Come now, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Okay? I, I sometimes say, man plans and God laughs. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's kind of interesting. Now, I'm not saying planning is bad. I'm a planner, and I think, um, you know, there's this, the phrase, those who fail to plan, plan to fail, okay, if you've heard that. And so we do need to plan, but the problem with this is the, he's, he's um, James is, I don't know scolding is the right word, um, but he's, he's doing this because we're planning without considering God in the mix. You know, it's what I'm going to do, what I'm going to get, what I want in my life, and we don't consider what God wants in our lives. That should be the primary thing, and I've talked about this before, you know, I mean, you ask God for a car, you know, why do you want a car? Well, we need a car to go back and forth and work, and that's a good reason, and, you know, so forth. Uh, you don't need a Mercedes-Benz probably, you know, although if you have enough money and you're wealthy and you want to buy a Mercedes-Benz, I'm not against that. I'm not saying you can, but I'm saying a much more appropriate thing was I want a car because, you know, there's some folks that need to get from uh, point A to point B. Maybe, I mean, um, Ivan's house uh, takes old people, you know, older than me. <laughs> they can't drive, can't see, and they, they take them to doctor's appointments and to the grocery store. And so if you want a car f to help with a little bit of that or participate, take the kids to a youth camp or, or, you know, whatever it is. That's a little bit more in tune with what God wants, you know, than just, I want a new car, you know, because this old one's so bad. Um, I mean, my personal thing is, I don't buy new cars, okay? Some people do, and they can afford them. If you can afford one and pay cash for it, God bless you, you know? But I'm not going to spend thirty dollars or $40,000 or sometimes a lot more than that on a car, you know? My, my limit's like four, five, or $6,000, you know? And I've got a car now that I bought for $4,000, and unfortunately it won't die, you know, because I'd love to have a hybrid, but I, I can't... I can't throw something away that's still working well in order to get something else. So, you know, I, I just, that's the way I am, you know. I mean, that's not a good investment in my book, you know. And if you're paying, if you're paying interest on a car or borrow money in a car, um, I, I think you can do a lot better, okay. Uh, once that's over, continue to put that money away, save it, and then go out and buy cash. I mean, I needed a car once, and I saved like 100 bucks a month or something like that, uh, you know, towards a car. I had 1,800 hours. I went down to the local guy that I know, and I said, I need a car for $1,800 because that's all the cash I got. And he had a car on his lot that was $1,800, and I drove for two or three years until I ran out of, had out of oil one day, and it um, seized on me, you know. But by that time, I had $4,000 and go back and buy a new car to, to replace that one. You see what I'm saying? So um, what is our motives? That's the problem here. It's not that they weren't plan it's that planning is bad, but they were planning without considering God. They're saying, well, you know, next, tomorrow I'll go and, uh, you know, I'm going to do this business transaction. I'll do that business transaction. I'm going to make this much money, and as soon as I get this much money in the bank, I'm going to buy that, you know. We got all our plans. But have we ever thought what God wants? I might step on toes here. You know, um, who was it? Was it Marie Osmond who was on the news this last week saying she wasn't going to give a penny to any of her kids? Anybody see that newscast? Hmm, I must be the only one that watches that channel. I think it was Marie Osmond. But she said, you know, uh, uh, you know it makes kids feel entitled and lazy. She said, they're not going to get a penny of anything. Let them own their own money. And she's going to give money to charity. Well, God bless her, you know. And I'm not saying don't give any money to your children, but... What is the reason God allows you to earn money and have money? It's to take care of yourself and your family, right? But it's to bless him, you know? So when we die, our inheritance really should be, first of all, you know, what, what is needed by my family in order to do what, they, what they're going to do? But above and beyond that, all the excess goes to God in some way. And there's many, there are many good Christian organizations, your church first of all, but I mean missionaries and mission organizations, things that are, that are credible that, that could use our funding. So when we look at when we have plans, 
How much are we involving God in those plans? Apparently, profit making was their entire goal. I think of the days of Noah. Do you remember when, what Noah was like? You know, they, they went on and they didn't believe Noah. They just went on and says they went on just like everything was normal. They were making their plans, you know, and hey, in five years, I'm going to take my trip to Disney in that uh, day and age. I don't know what it was back then. Maybe it was to a mountain or something. Uh, whatever it was. And all of a sudden, the brain came and guess what? They were all dead because they didn't make their plans with God. Now, Noah, he made a little different decision. God said, this is what's going to happen. He said, he said, build an ark. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to make my plans. And my plans are going to be for four or 500 years, and I'm going to still live. But those plans are going to include what God wants me to do. I'm going to build this ark. And that's what happened. So we need to make sure we include plans, um, include God in our plans. Um, what we don't know or don't realize is in verse 14a. And it says in verse 14, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. And then it goes on in the second part, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You don't know what your life is going to be like. Now, I, I'm going to share a personal thing here. Um, in, my, in my Bible, and I had to look it up because I had taken it out with some of my notes for a little while back, but I've carried this thing for years with me. And this chart, I plan. <laughs> this chart, they made me do my first class at Dallas. And um, I was supposed to take my entire life back, all the way back to birth. And I had all these things, your age, your education, your secular employment, your church. Uh, and, and you listed everything down the left column that would be a part of your life. And this is, this is it. That's just, a, that's just a portion. I don't know if you can see it up there. Mm, maybe a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to show you the detail that I went to and had to go to in this chart. Okay, so I started back when I was born, and if you look back at the very first one, it says uh, age, uh, you know, 1955, that was age zero, that's the second line down, my age is zero, and then down there, uh, it says, um, you know, life divisions, and I put public school, that was this life division, in the yellow, that was life division. The next one in blue was professional education, and that's going to college and seminary. And then down uh, the chapter title, Getting Started, Putting It Together, Heritage, um, you know, in the, in the left was Manning from Baptist Church where I grew up. Uh, and at any rate, all detail. I'm not concerned that you see all the detail here. What I want to tell you is what it, that I kind of, I had to analyze my entire life. If you go to the next slide, Sean, uh, next slide, Sean, this was the ending of it. So if you take the whole thing and move it out like this, this is this right portion over here. And the question mark was I didn't know what was going to go in the future. Okay, but the thing that always that always um, stuck out to me on this, and why I share it with you, is if you look up there, and I don't know if you can s you can see the purple ones. The purple starts at 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. Okay, I went to seminary in August, or, or excuse me, in July of 2006. Okay, so I'm doing this chart, and I'm thinking, well. I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know how long the seminary is going to take me. It might have taken me six years, nine years maybe. I don't know. They almost threw me out because it took so long, because of special circumstances, which I'll share with you. But this was 2006. I did this chart in August. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm not what I'm doing in 2007 and 2008. I'm going back to the church, you know, and I'm going to get ready for another deployment and so forth. And so I was, I was bold enough to plan my, plan my calendar all the way out to 2008. And I left it after that open because I wasn't sure what was going to go on. That was August of 2008. Excuse me, July. On August 16th of 2006, after dropping off my sons at their two colleges, Jonathan had a heart attack and wound up in the hospital. And uh, I actually have my phone, I didn't put it up here, but I have my date timers from back there. I mean, I had a Crest conference, which was a, was a chaplain's conference planned at the end of August, the, the end of August that month, and I had things in, in September and October. My, my plans were made, but on August 16th, let me tell you, everything changed at 10.54 in the evening, and, I, and on my calendar, I looked, I found that calendar going back, it says, uh, it says right on it, 10.54, call about Jonathan. That's the time I got that call. And we were on a plane the next morning out there not knowing what was going on. And, and I, I don't say this to, for you to feel sorry for me or anything. I'm just saying this to say that, you know, I was planning according to what God did. But I'll tell you what, after this, uh, <laughs> I wondered if anything was worth planning, you know. 
<laughs> because my whole plan, my whole, not only my plans, my life, my wife's life, our, our kids' lives, everybody changed. Jamie, that was the year we were going to put all of our time into Jamie homeschooling because Melissa put so much time into Caleb to get him through. She, she felt like she had neglected Jamie uh, in her homeschooling, and Jamie wound up getting, give him a computer by a friend, and she wound up doing most of her, her that year online instead of getting the personal attention she should have had. We got to that Crest Conference. I told you that chaplain, Chaplain's Conference at the end of August. And I'm sitting there with Jonathan. He's in a coma. Nothing's happening. And um, we weren't getting any money from the military. And I would get paid if I went down. So I said to Lois, I said, well, what should we do? And she said, well, why don't you go? I'm, you know, there's nothing we can do here. We can use the funds. And you plan to go to this conference. And it's good for you. And I went down. And I'm just a little, little bit of detail that I plan on putting here. But um, the conference I was going to was in Baltimore, Jody. You folks might have been there, then I just didn't know it. Went to Baltimore, and um, you'll remember that, you'll know if you were there when I tell you the story, but we went down to Baltimore, and I remember coming into Baltimore, and uh, as I flew, after we got in, I took my, my vehicle, whatever it was, you know, they had a, some sort of a thing, pick us up at the airport and take me to the hotel, and I, I saw on the top of a building, I could have swear I was, it said, believe. This big sign, believe, and I thought, that's, I, I must have not seen that right, you know, or something, you know. I'm going through, and there's another newspaper, and on the, the newspaper stand, and on the top of it, there's this big and bold pin, believe. And I forget, the th three times I saw this word believe, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm flying here, and Jonathan's in a coma, you know, and, and who knows what's going him, and, and, and I'm in Baltimore, and three signs say believe. What in the world is going on? Uh, you know, is God sent me a special message? And he may have. He may have changed the whole of Baltimore for this, but I understand, uh, I found out later on that the Baltimore mayor was trying to upgrade the looks of, of Baltimore and make people think that it's a good place rather than a bad place that was looked at at that point. And so their theme was believe, believe in Baltimore. But to me, do you remember that? Do you remember that? That was when I was in Baltimore. To me it was, you know, believe in God in this situation. And then, believe it or not, I got down to the I got down to that, and one of the chaplains was was telling how um, his his he was he was miss, he missed it because he was in the um, he was uh, doing the the things with the um, the ski the skidoos you know in, in the in the uh, in the water you know you have the ski things and um, was that a motorboat I can't remember but somehow his daughter or son whichever one it was. Uh, fell off, they didn't see her, and ran over and killed him. And that child was the same age as my son Jonathan. I was thankful that my, but it was another person to deal with. And then one of the speakers at that conference uh, told about their son who had had a, uh, who had a, a brain injury of some sort. And, you know, um, he told the story. And it related so much to where I was. And I became friends with that chaplain, and he was, I was, I was like a lowly major at that time, and he was like a full bird colonel or something. And, I, happen, I talked to him, made friends with him, and, and, and kept friendships with him over the years uh, as his child tried to regain usage for that uh, time. That was the, Lois was not with me. That was another time we were in Baltimore. I'm sorry. Lois went with once. We were down there when the earthquake hit. I don't know if you remember the earthquake. Uh, but, uh, I, was, I was in the uh, main room with all these chaplains, and my wife and uh, Josh were in the aquarium. They abandoned the, there was an earthquake in Baltimore, they abandoned the aquarium, and I think one of the tanks broke, and I'm sitting in the, in, and I've never been overseas at that point, and not in, uh, in a war zone, and um, the chandeliers were you know, rattling in the auditorium I was in, and we had chaplains diving underneath the tables, because when things shattered around you, you dove under, under cover overseas because a mortar was coming in. And so they were acclimated to that, and so that was their experience. And I never experienced that before, so uh, seeing those with my fellow chaplains. But at any rate, all that long story to tell you that, you know, <clears throat> plans change. And we can't see that far. And it's not wrong to say tomorrow or the next day or something, because we're going to do, do some sort of a, an action, you know. But, and I still don't know why that took place, you know. It was, a, it was almost a similar thing to, the, what's the guy's name, the football player who had the heart attack a couple weeks ago on the field? And they, huh? Harp? 
Hamlet. Yep, that's the guy. I, I couldn't remember his name fully, but I mean, he was, uh, he's, now t he's now, I understand, making actions and talking a little bit. Miraculous recover. But um, they had medics right there at that second. It took seven minutes for an ambulance to get to Jonathan. You know, uh, we don't know why. But I think this section is saying, plan if God wills. You know, and that's, what I had, that's what, how I had to look at this, you know. Um, you know, I don't know why this happened. I don't know where things are going, but it, it, it changed our entire life. In fact, I was supposed to go on a deployment to overseas, and they used that, I say, as an excuse because there was another chaplain who wanted to go to my place, and they used, he was higher ranking, and he used that as an excuse to keep me off of that tour. I trained my guys to go. I was planning to go. Carissa was coming home. She was going to help with Lois to Jonathan. I was going to go, and I didn't get to go. And then eventually that year they said, you know, we got a lot of lieutenant colonels here that are in major slots. Why don't you find someplace else? I thought I was going to be retire in the National Guard. So I went over to the reserves. And lo and behold, I got in the reserves, got deployed with them, uh, wound up being the, uh, the commander of a chaplain unit. Uh, and chaplains are never commanders. You cannot be a commander as a chaplain because you're not in the, the chain of command unless you're in a chaplain unit, chaplain detachment. And there's only chaplains and chaplain assistants, so I wound up being a commander of a unit, which I would have never got in the Guard, and I wound up getting promoted to full bird colonel, which would have never happened in the Guard either. Now, I'm not saying that's why it happened with Jonathan, but it changed the course of my whole direction, and Lois's also. So, as we plan, recognize that it's good to plan, but that God can change our plans, just like that. And then, on the, if you go to the next slide, uh, I lost my place here, James. Okay, there we go. Um, what we should remember is in 14b. In 14b, it says, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, if, when we think of the, the, the long term of everything, it's just, uh, you know, we're here for 70 or 80 years, the most maybe for the average. <coughs> but when you think of 2,000 years since Jesus Christ and another, you know, 4,000 before that, and that's just, the, that's just us believing that. Other people say there's billions of years. We're just here for a short time. And we're like a vapor. And we need to make use of that. Uh, there was a news station this last week, and we'll tell you which news station, but they were, they had a memorial. Of, of, they, they talked about a memorial. They put a picture of a, a, a man that was 47 years of age with his wife and his two teenage kids. He had died of a heart attack the night before. One of the main newscasters had been on all their broadcasts, you know? And, uh, you know, 47, you know? Who dies at 47 of a heart attack, you know? But gone. And I'm sure that was not his plans. But we're a vapor. We need to make sure that we look at the long-term plan for us, which is heaven. It doesn't end here. What are we doing in total with our life, not just here on earth? When the Eastern Empires were crowned at Constantinople, it said that um, the custom was to uh, have the royal mason bring them a slab of a couple of slabs of, of, uh, of uh, not concrete, but uh, um, marble. And they were at their coronation to choose which one of those pieces of marble they wanted used as their tombstone. Kind of weird or different. But it shows this idea that when you start, you have to realize there's an end coming. What are you going to do with your life? Pastor Scott, when he does funerals, often will use a, uh, a popular poem called The Dash. You know? And if you've ever heard that, you can look it up on the, on the, on the internet. But it's, it's, you have your, your date of birth and your date of death. But what most, what's most important is the dash in between. How did you spend your life? What do we do? It's short. The rich man in, the, uh, in, Lazarus, in, in Luke 12, right? I'm going to, he was one of these merchants he's talking about. I'm going to, you know, let me build bigger barns. You know, I can buy more land. I can, get, I can get richer and do more stuff. But he didn't have God's focus in mind. And God said to him, what does it matter if tonight your life is required of you? Are we living our lives to benefit God? How are we looking at it? And that's James' point, uh, James point here. Uh, I love this, this quote. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Houses won't stay. The kind of car you have, nobody will forget. I look at all this stuff in my house, you know. 
pity my kids, you know. I, just, I, I don't like to get rid of stuff. I mean, there's stuff for my grandparents, and there's stuff for my dad, and there, there's things that I, I cherish. But my aunt passed away, and she had no children. And I've got some of her stuff, you know. It's just like, it's stuff. It, you know, I mean, I have all this chaplain stuff, notes and, and records and everything else that are so important, you know. And yet, I don't use them anymore because I'm not a chaplain. And they're basically just paper that should be that maybe will have to be shredded. It's hard for me to do it now, but you know, and get rid of them early. But the stuff that's going to last is the stuff that we do for Jesus Christ. Robert Horton made this statement: "The greatest lesson I have learned. Listen to this carefully. I'll repeat it twice. The greatest lesson I have learned from life is that people who set their minds and hearts on money or possessions are equally disappointed whether they get it or not." Sound interesting. The greatest lesson I've learned from life is that people who set their minds and hearts on money or possessions are equally disappointed whether they get it or not. Isn't that true? You know, if we don't get it, we're unhappy. If we get it, we thought, well, there's, I wish I could have more. You know, it just never stops. Next slide, if you would. Um, Job, as you remember, had a lot of these issues in his life when uh, Satan was attacking him. And he made a few statements that uh, talked about the brevity of life in his case. My, light, my lip days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to an end without hope. Of course, at that point, he has the, all the boils he's dealing with. Um, when a cloud vanishes, it is gone. So he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. Once you're dead, you're dead. Doesn't mean there's not life after death, but, you know, there's no more life here on earth. 9, 25, and 26. Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They slip by like reed boats, like an angel that swoops on its prey. And then lastly, man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Like a flower, he comes forth and withers. He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. The second passage part here, and we'll have to go through this faster. I didn't realize we went on. I, I expanded a little bit more in my life than I expand on. If you go to the next slide, um, the second part of this is always plan if the Lord wills. This is one of your contrasts, okay? Um, what should we do? From the Psalms, it says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. We don't make our plans and then ask for God's blessings. We need to find out what God's plans are and then do those. In Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 18, and one part of that it says, you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who is giving you the power to make wealth. You know, you look at your bottom line, you look at all you have and think, you know, um, what if you became like Jonathan tomorrow? It could happen. What if you were like my son Jonathan is today, tomorrow? You know, we have these plans to make wealth. We have to understand that our ability to make wealth, and Jonathan would have been, uh, he had such a brilliant mind, 3.97 average in electrical engineering. The kid would have made more in his first year than I am making now, <laughs> you know. Uh, he was brilliant, but all that changed. We have to realize God gives us the power. Don't say, oh, well, look at this great thing I created, or look at all my abilities in this area. Well, God gave you those abilities. If he didn't give you those abilities, you wouldn't be able to do what you do. You know, gave you a mind to be able to teach, gave you abilities to be able to be an electrician, and I can pick out all the different ones of, that we have, their assets. It's all God-given. God gives us the power to make wealth. Paul said this. If you, look in the, if you look in the New Testament, he said on three different occasions, in Acts 18, 21, next slide, guys, um, I will come back to Ephesus if it is God's will. Um, maybe I didn't put these in. 1 Corinthians 4, 19, I will come to you shortly um, if the Lord wills. 1 Corinthians 16, 7, I will tarry a little while with you if the Lord permits. We need to make sure that God is the first part of everything we do. Um, there was a native Congo, um, a national in Congo, who prayed this, Dear Lord, you be the needle and I will be the thread. You go first and I will follow wherever you lead me. Isn't that a neat illustration? Let God be the needle in our lives. And let us be the thread and follow wherever he wants. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths or make your paths straight. Second thing, what we should not do, and this is in verse 16, it says, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. 
He's looking back at what we should not do. He's, he's looking back at verse 13. Those who say, you know, tomorrow I'll do this, and I'll do this and next year, and I have all these plans. And says, that really becomes arrogant boasting if we say, oh, I can do this. I mean, the stock market could get out tomorrow, or it could go up, you know? We don't have control over a lot of stuff in our lives. Um, so we need to keep in mind that we need to follow him. It made me think of a song, um, with eternity's values in view, Lord, with eternity's values in view, let me, let, may I do each day's work for Jesus with eternity's values in view. We shouldn't boast about tomorrow. And then lastly, verse 17, always follow God's plan. Um, this is talking about the sin of omission, okay? When you look at this, listen to this. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I thought he was trying to say, initially when I looked at it, I thought he was trying to say, you know, um, if you don't know that it's sin, then it's not sin. And that's not what he's trying to say. Um, if you look in, in Deuteronomy, um, it says that, you know, uh, if, you, if you sin, um, that uh, there's the, the sacrifice is, and here well, in, in Leviticus, it's actually a second verse here. If a person acts unfaithfully and sins unintentionally against the Lord's holy things, then he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord. I've often wondered, what do you do if you intentionally did something wrong? It's almost as if there's no, there's no forgiveness for that sin, you know? I mean, don't bother building a guilt offering. You pretended to kill the guy, you killed the guy, forget it. Now, if you, the axe head flew off and you know, unintentionally killed the guy, bring an offering, but if you did it intentionally, I don't know what it is. But, you know, it's not the idea that if you do something unintentionally, uh, then it's not sin, because it says here, you know, um, still bring an offering. So you still are sorry for anything that's wrong that you didn't know about. But here he's saying, in this passage, I think, is that we should, we should do the right, if we know to do the right thing, and we don't do it, then it's sin for us. And that's the first verse. Samuel's talking to David, and he says, or he says, moreover, as for me, I think it's David, it could be Saul, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. What do you know to do good? He's talking about this whole passage. You know not to plan without God. You know that there's a lot of commands in, in the scripture that say things we should do. Um, things we should, uh, you know, there's, there's giving, there's, um, there's uh, spiritual gifts, there's attending church, there's taking care of your family, you know, there's, if you don't work, you don't eat. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we should be doing. So sometimes we sin, we do things that we know are wrong, but sometimes we sin because we just don't do the things that we know are right. And that's what he's saying here. I've given you a lesson about not boasting, about looking at the future, and about doing what's right. The Levite in the Good Samaritan story and the priest in the Good Samaritan story violated this. They knew what to do right to stop for the Good Samaritan, but they didn't do it. It was the sin of omission, not doing what God wants us to do. What should you be doing? Is there something you should stop doing? Is there something you should start doing? Is there something or some ministry that you should be involved in? You need to work for the person who knows to do the right thing and does it not, it is sin. There are so many things. May we do what God wants us to do and when we plan according to his will. Last slide, Sean. Our conclusion, if you don't do what you know is right, you sin. If you don't do what you know is right, you sin. So whatever you know to do, do it. Let us be those that follow what God wants us to do and don't wind up planning without him in focus. And when God changes your plans like he did with, my, with me when Jonathan had his heart attack, then we look to God and say, you know what, I'm not going to blame you but you've got a different plan than I had. I had this plan, but you took a left turn here. I'm going to follow the new plan. And I'm not going to be angry about it because I know you are in control. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for all that you do. We ask that you just might give us this, your blessing this week as we plan and as we work that we might do everything according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing one final song, Amazing Grace. Sing grace, how sweet the 
Everybody go in peace.